guys, welcome back to Forensic Friday, where I tell you one true crime case that was solved using forensic science all while doing, that's right, my makeup. As I stated in my last video, this idea was inspired by a YouTuber named Bailey Sarian. She does murder mysteries and makeup Mondays. Most of her content revolves around cannibalism, which is really creepy, but also I'm kind of addicted to. I will leave a link to her channel in the description below. Today's video is gonna be featuring the new Jeffree Star and Shane Dawson mini controversy palette. I'm so excited because I have not had the chance to play in this puppy yet. All the other products that I'm using in this this video will be linked in the description below. This story starts with a bright young student named Shannon Melindy. She wanted to be a lawyer and she was a really, really good student. Her parents says that she was the perfect child any parents could ever have, that she approached everything in her life with gusto and she was just really, really brave person, but she wanted to become a lawyer. She was like top in her class in high school and after high school, she moved on to Emory College in Atlanta. My camera keeps shutting off every 20 seconds, so I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get through this video today. So if you see me in like different clothes, Shannon was the type of girl who knew exactly what she wanted in life. Everyone that talked about her just said that she would walk into a room and just light it up. Everyone loved her. Her first two years at Emory College was very uneventful, according to friends and family members, until about two years later in March of 1994, where she went missing without a trace. So on the day that Shannon vanished, she was working at a softball tournament to earn extra money. She was working as like, one of those people to keep scores of the game. She was working the morning game for the first time ever. They broke for lunch and people reported seeing her leave for lunch, but no one seems to remember seeing her ever return. So a friend of the family actually came up and um, told the parents what was going on, that Shannon had been missing and disappeared. So uh, obviously the parents in a panic contacted the police and put out a missing report on their daughter. And I think like they said instantly the father kind of he felt something wasn't right and he was he just was so shaken up by the entire thing that he kind of fell to the ground in tears and just saying like we're never gonna see her again like he just felt something was wrong initially the police thought that this was probably some kind of college prank there was no real reason for Shannon to come up missing she had just gotten back from spring break with her friends her guy friends and girlfriends she probably met a bunch of different guys and girls and maybe she's just hanging out with them so the police's attitude for days and days while this young girl is missing is that this is just college girls gone wild type of prank thing they really was not bothered by it at all or taking it that serious at all. Shannon's college roommate actually found her car abandoned at a local gas station nearby with her keys still in the car. Police actually told her to drive the car back to campus. So the car was never treated as evidence. It was never like swabbed down. There was it was never investigated at all. Not only that, since the roommate has now driven the car, her fingerprints and DNA is now in the car. And I just feel like it makes it a lot harder to figure out and narrow down how the night went and what happened. At that point, the evidence is now tampered with, so it's... I don't know what they were thinking. Now it's been many days after Shannon's disappearance. It's been many days that a number of people have actually been in the car and put their DNA and fingerprints in the car. 10 days after Shannon's disappearance, her college campus actually gets a phone call from an unknown male who says that he has Shannon and is holding her hostage. He has her ring that her aunt gave to her and that she's okay and she will be returned back to her family once he gets his demands. He said Shannon is okay, she misses her family, and then he hung up. So obviously her parents thought that she was still alive at that point. After that day, they never heard from the mysterious caller again. The FBI traced the call to a payphone about 20 miles away, but they couldn't get any fingerprints. They did, however, find a small cloth bag with Shannon's ring inside that was wrapped in masking tape. At this point, when they found the cloth bag, police were thinking, there's hope. 
Shannon might actually be alive and we could probably find her based off of this ring. So now it's time to go into the palette. I'm actually going to do my eyes first this time. I normally do foundation first, but I'm going to do my eyes first. Then I'm going to start off with these blues because they are so gorgeous and I just, I can't help myself. So anyway, back to the story. One of the pictures at the game that she was working that day said that there was some really bizarre stuff going on. So Justin, one of the guys that was a pitcher in the game said that the Empire that day could not keep his eyes off of Shannon at all. He kept turning around and looking. He said that like in the middle of a pitch, he would turn around and go back and start talking to the girl. Obviously the pitcher thought this was so, so bizarre and he was getting really irritated and upset because one, he's never seen anything like that before. And two, um, they're in the middle of a game. The plate empire ended up being 33-year-old Butch Hanton. He worked at Delta Airlines. People describe him as a very charismatic guy. They said he used to teach Sunday school to kids and just that he was a really nice guy. He was reactive in his church. He played sports. When questioned by police, Butch actually admits to seeing um, Shannon that day but said that he didn't see her at all after the game. He claims to have gone directly home and made like seven different telephone calls to friends. So I guess he was thinking that this would be his alibi. Of course, the police checked his phone records and they were able to confirm his alibi. Police also got a search warrant for Butch's home, but they didn't find anything. At this point, the police doesn't hear anything back from Shannon's supposed kidnapper. And this is where the trail kind of starts to go cold. Six months later, the police actually returns back to Butch's home. But this time they were there to investigate a fire that was started in one of the upstairs bedrooms of his home. He alleged that the fire was started with a vacuum cleaner, but after further investigation by the police, they were able to tell that the fire was actually started by arson. Police found that accelerant was actually poured on the floor and then ignited. He made an insurance claim there was fraud involved, so a whole bunch of other stuff he had going on. While investigating the fire, police actually learned from Butch's neighbors that the night of Shannon's disappearance, they saw him out in his backyard doing a bonfire. They said that they had really eerie feelings about it, that it was just so strange and odd. They said that it was very eerie and chilling to them, very bizarre that he would be lighting the fire uh, at that time. So police search Bush's home again. This time they have like massive diggers and dump trucks. Upon digging up the spot where he had the bonfire, they find tons of sweaters in a very, very petite size. They said it had to be like a dozen women's sweaters. That's so odd. According to one of the police officers that was on the case, he actually knew Butch's wife and said that none of those sweaters would have ever fit her body type. So whose sweaters were these? 12 female sweaters in your backyard? That's weird. So none of the sweaters belonged to anyone living in Butch's home at the time. Also, Shannon's parents didn't recognize any of the sweaters as being items of hers. Butch and I knowing anything about these sweaters, he said that it was probably left there by the previous owners. <laughs> the police was not buying that at all. This was extremely alarming to FBI because it's obvious like 12 other sweaters. Who else are we missing? What other victims are out there that we don't know about? He sent the sweaters to the FBI forensic lab in Washington, D.C., and they found no blood evidence or DNA evidence on the sweaters. Also in the fire pit, police found rubber pants like that of a crime scene investigator. They found uh, cleaning supplies and rubber ties. In Butcher's garage, they found nine rolls of tape, the same type of tape that they found wrapped around Shannon's ring. But none of this actually pointed to murder. So Butch did go on trial for the arson and false claims and mail fraud with the insurance company. He was sentenced to nine years in prison. Funny thing is, is that during this time, no one heard from Shannon or her supposed kidnapper. Since the prime suspect of the case, Butch, was already in prison, um, the case kind of fell to the wayside by the police 
it was never actually closed, but people just kind of stopped taking interest in it and there wasn't too much work being done on it. Eventually, Shannon's case was picked up again by two investigators. And these investigators decided to go back and take a look at the original crime scene where it all began, which was at that telephone stand. They really believed that Butch was the guy, but they had no forensic evidence. And that was a huge part of this case that they actually need. They sent all the evidence back to the forensic lab. The forensic scientists took a look at the ring to see if she could get any fingerprints from it, but there was actually no fingerprints or DNA whatsoever on the actual ring itself. So the bag that the ring actually came in was one of the most important pieces of evidence that they had. The prosecutors found out that the bag was actually manufactured by the Mill Coopers Corporation. Millheiser had only one customer in Georgia that bought those bags. It was a paper company in Atlanta. The FBI was able to use this forensic science and trace it all the way back to the original customer, which is Delta Airlines. Coincidentally, Butch worked at it as a mechanic. My camera broke you guys so i am back to finish this story and this look for you guys it has been a couple days that is the reason why my hair is different and i look different but let's just get back into the story and continue now delta employees use these bags to ship small parts from the airplane when police looked back at the original evidence they found similar cloth bags in the desk at butch's work there was additional pressure on the prosecution because Butch was actually about to be released from his arson prison sentence. So now, 10 years later, forensic science could now link Butch to the bag. They compared the bag found in Butch's desk with the bag that they found that contained Shannon's ring. They did a thread count. They measured the distance between the weaves and the actual bag. Both bags were consistent in construction and size. What do you know? The weave pattern was identical as well. Both drawstrings were made of the same cotton and polyester microfiber. Then scientists compared the tape that was wrapped around Shannon's ring to the rolls of tape that they found in Butch Hinton's garage. And of course, they matched. The adhesive on the back of the tape was consistent as well as the length and width of the tape that they found in Butch Hinton's garage. So he's busted. They also noticed something on the tape that was wrapped around Shannon's ring that they had overlooked earlier on in the investigation. Tiny metallic particles that were clearly visible, these small particles only showed up when they used a special equipment called an infrared spectrometer. So a little research into this particle in particular, they were able to identify it. They found that these particles were very, very unique. In fact, there was only one company at that time that was using these particular particles. Investigators found that the only industries using this particular alloy was the aerospace industry, which we can link back to Delta Airlines. Remarkably, at the time of Shannon's disappearance, Delta Airlines was using this particular alloy. They were using them in their jet engine parts. Investigators found the same particular alloy on the rolls of tapes confiscated from Butch Hinton's garage, probably because he had taken them from work. Prosecutors found one last piece of information in Butch Hinton's background that shocked everyone. Before he moved to Atlanta, Butch Hinton had three prior convictions in Illinois for sexual assault and kidnapping. On one of these cases, his wife walked in on him assaulting a 14-year-old girl. She later testified against him. Butch actually only spent four years in prison for that crime. So prosecutors actually believe that after the softball game, uh, Butch actually took Shannon and assaulted her that day. He then decided to call all of his friends, his wife, his co-worker. He made several different phone calls at an attempt to gain an alibi. He drove Shannon's car to a parking lot, left the keys inside, and then returned home. He most likely killed Shannon later that night. Now, whether he cremated her body at home in his backyard in that bonfire, or somewhere else remains a mystery. They have yet to find Shannon's body. After hearing the evidence, it was no shocker that the jury found Butch guilty of murder. Butch was sentenced to life in prison. As you can imagine, the family was very, very emotional just getting that conviction finally after so many years. Can you imagine over a decade? Finally, justice had been served. Okay, you guys, so this is the finished look. What do you guys think about this case and my makeup look? Please let me know in the comments down below. If you like videos like these, then check out my last episode. I will leave a link on the screen right here. 
And as always, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe if you don't want to miss out on any of my future episodes. And I will see you guys next Friday with another Forensic Files case. Bye!